On October 28th of 2004, Dave Shaw broke four world records while diving in Bushman's Hole, South Africa's deepest freshwater cave. Despite breaking the world records for depth on a rebreather, depth in a cave on a rebreather, depth at altitude on a rebreather, and depth running a line, what perhaps was most shocking that day wasn't what Dave accomplished. When he finally surfaced after nine hours and 40 minutes of diving, it wasn't his world records he wanted to celebrate. What he really wanted was to recover the body that he found. Uh, I think I know where this is going. Oh, it's a disaster. I'm so intrigued. Uh, just wait, it gets worse. We are just the masters of disasters, aren't we? Calamity Janes. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Calamity Janes, a podcast where two sisters who are anything but plain Janes talk about disaster. I'm Bailey. I'm Madison. Madison, tell me about what disaster you're going to tell me about today. Smooth. That Thank was great. You. Thank you so much. We are talking about the Bushman's Hole diving disaster. Go ahead. I'm. Go ahead. Nope. No, no, it's a perfectly normal name that does not conjure any um This is a clean podcast. Jokes in my mind. This, this is, is a clean podcast, podcast, which is why there is nothing. I'm not going to say anything. Good job. Okay. So our story actually begins 10 years earlier on December 17th, 1994. You with me? I am with you in 1994. I was five. You weren't born. That's true. I still had another seven and a half months after this. You did. Dion Dreyer was a 20-year-old South African recreational scuba diver with a passion for loud music, fast cars, and pushing the limits. He had Ooh, I I was gonna say same, then I was like, no, I no. don't I don't actually like maybe fast cars. I guess I like loud music. But I like I, safety. <laughs> I love Both of my feet on the ground. If I can be laying down in something soft, I prefer even that. Yep. Still. Laying (laughs) still. Still. Yes. He had an adventurous spirit and was eager to explore new opportunities. So when several divers from the South African Cave Diving Association asked him to provide support for a deep technical dive at Bushman scheduled for later in the week, Dion jumped at the opportunity. I'm not sure exactly what kind of support he was providing, but I would assume it would have been like laying lines or gas canisters along those lines before they were going to go and do the big shebang. Gotcha. And just to have like a seasoned pro and his um, with his background and experience in addition. At 20 years old. Yeah. Hey, (laughs) he's a professional adventurer. Yeah, he definitely was that. The divers at Bushman's that day reported that Dion was lost on a scent around 50 meters or 160 feet for those of us in the U.S. It was assumed that he had suffered from oxygen toxicity or hypercapnia, essentially a deep water blackout of some sort as a result of the high work rate of breathing that rendered him unconscious and unable to surface appropriately. Can you, just as we're talking about this, explain to me the conditions... Is it a hole? Like I'm, envi- I'm envisioning, like literally a a cavern underground, underwater. So like it's also dark. He's 150. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. So that's a really good question. Um. So there are lots of pictures of where this is. So big picture. Um. It kind of looks like, uh, it's like pretty sparse, kind of dry area. With yes, if you look it up, you can help me. Yeah, you can help me paint this beautiful word picture for everyone listening. Um, Some brush in the area, kind of rocky. Then there's literally just like a scar in the land, like like an open wound. So it's like a crevice down into the ground. Um, I think it's like a hundred feet of like rocky, like uh, descent down to where the entrance pond is. So when you look at it, um, when it's not disturbed, it's like covered in a thin layer of bright green algae and Mm -hmm. you would look at it and you'd be like, Ooh, I'm going to avoid that. Yeah. But, um, and it's really small, the entrance, but, uh, so it looks just like a normal little pond. And then once you get into it, it bottlenecks. So it's really, um, like much bigger than a human sized neck, but it's pretty narrow. And then once you get past that, it's just this huge, expansive cave. But everything is underwater. Like, everything is under the entrance pond. 
This looks petrifying. It actually looks like the entry when Andrew and I did the Crystal Maiden tour in Belize. Mm -hmm. It looks like that entry, but then you get in and it's just all underwater, all internal. It's like an earth pocket that you swim into. Yeah. Well, and this, there is no like walking into a cave. It's all underwater. So it's like it has a tiny little rocky shore next to it. Still Mm -hmm. all like well beneath the the earth's surface kind of thing yeah am i describing this kind of appropriately yeah i see the picture that i see there's a guy standing on a rocky shore a very shallow like Mm -hmm. in-depth rocky shore he's looking at a very small watery opening and like you said there's it's almost it doesn't even look like algae it looks like there are little tiny water like plants growing Mm -hmm. on the water yeah um but it's a very small surface area of water that you see but then there are other diagrams showing up that show it's like kind of like a reverse well yeah like an iceberg where Mm -hmm. everything else is underwater yeah exactly if you were just hiking out there and you Mm -hmm. saw it you would just think gross i don't want to fall into that and it's like a little lagoon yeah you would never think anything about it no so that's kind of what we're working with okay okay um okay so despite Dion's diving helmet being found on the C-note floor two weeks later, that's another word to describe this C-note or C-note. That's, um, you might have seen pictures of that. That's when there is like a hole in the earth and you could like fall down into like a cave that, if you look it up, can you help me describe it? I'm really struggling here. They're the really cool pictures that you see sometimes of like, People who are jumping into watering holes, but there's, like, earth all around them. Oh, yes. Um, Let me – I'm going to try and find one that's, like – You're, like, in a room in the earth, like, all natural, and there's, like, a a tiny skylight. Yes, yeah. They're mostly circular. You you walk into, like, a a rock – circular rock room of earth, and then there's, like, a circular pool of water in the center of that. Yeah. So I think this is technically like that, but it it, it doesn't really feel so much like that. Um, no, this is not as pretty. Yeah. Yeah, it's really not very cool looking on the outside. Sorry, I feel like... like waterfalls coming in. Oh, oh my God. I want a vacation. I want a vacation. I'm looking up all these tropical... I know. People having Insta-fun... I know. You and me both. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm trying my best to describe this. I really am. But So wait, what does this cenote have to do with? That's just what it's called. But like the technical geographic or sorry, geologic term for what this is. They found they found his diving helmet on the floor of the cave underwater. And the cave is technically a cenote. Yes. I see. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. The rest of this should be much more straightforward. I Thank promise. Goodness. Okay. So they found his helmet, but they did not find his body. So um, they, I didn't write this down, but I did read this somewhere that typically when it comes to cave diving or technical diving, there is a lot of planning. There's a lot of like teamwork that goes into it. And typically when someone dies, it's very unusual to not find a body. Um, so this left a really big impression in the technical diving community, everyone, especially in South Africa, everyone knew that this happened and this is where it happened. So uh, his parents, Dion's parents, put a plaque in uh, Bushman's hole, like right above where the pond is, saying mm. that Dion's body was there, kind of as a grave. Aww. So everyone that went there knew that, you know. That it happened and that he was there. Yeah. So they never found his body until Dave's record-breaking dive 10 years later. So before we get too much into the story, let's talk about technical diving, what these people were doing. Technical diving is scuba diving that exceeds the agency-specified limits of recreational diving for non-professional purposes. To make a very long and controversial story short, there is not a good definition of what technical diving is or what it encompasses. Yeah, I was going to say, this is now the second time you've told me this definition, and I've tried to follow your words like a bouncing ball. And it's like, so someone who is a, is knowledgeable in scuba diving doing 
more and going further than they should. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's essentially a what, what I'm gleaming from the Wikipedia page and the other articles that I read. It's basically someone a scuba diver who is doing is going beyond what scuba teaches you to do. Where I they see. yeah, what they teach you to do, where they teach you to go, things like that for non-professional purposes. I see. So recreationally for funsies. And that is called technical diving. Yeah. Um, so I think technical as in like high tech because you are using okay. – that is another thing that I that was going to say, that's very confusing. It's yeah. it's like what does the word technical have anything to do with – it should be like danger diving or yeah, something. Yeah, I know because I was like I think scuba seems really technical. Yeah. But that is what – I got from the Wikipedia page because when you're doing um, like regular scuba diving, you are not using nearly as much equipment as you are with technical diving. I see. Okay. Okay. So for example, nitrox diving and rebreather diving were initially considered technical, but this isn't really the case anymore because some scuba certification agencies offer recreational nitrox and recreational rebreather training and certification. So it is just what is beyond the bounds of scuba. Gotcha. Some other entities define technical diving based on the depth and immersion time of the diver. So essentially what you could probably safely boil down to is anything outside of what's typically covered in recreational scuba. Okay. The implications of which, I guess we're, we're establishing, establishing this definition because does this absolve some people of... Does it implicate people? Is no, it important in it's mostly just so you understand that this isn't um this isn't someone just walking up to this hole with their flippers and their one oxygen tank on their back gotcha. and like going for a little explore. Okay. This I see. is complex. Weeks, yeah, this is weeks and weeks of planning, timing down to the second, down to the I minute. See. Yeah. Um so I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep explaining this to you because please press on. Yes, <laughs> but one of the biggest differences between technical diving and regular scuba is the risk, because technical diving is usually going a lot deeper. It's a lot more dangerous, not only because of temperature and pressure and the usual things that try to kill humans when we go places we aren't designed to go, but because when you go to those sorts of depths, you need a special concoction of gases to help you get there and come back alive. Oh, I did not know that. Yes. Breathing air under pressure starting at 30 meters can result in nitrogen narcosis, which can make a diver feel confused, disoriented, essentially drunk. They also, I think, call it like martini syndrome, uh, which makes it sound a lot more more fun than it actually is. Yeah. Yeah. So to prevent that, divers can use a mixture of helium-containing gases such as, I think it's pronounced trimix or trimix or heliox, to replace some or all of the inert fraction of the breathing gas with non-narcotic helium. Huh. I'm not going to pretend to know what that means. I don't think you should either. (laughs) Wasn't even going to. I don't know. Um, Um, Biochemistry is... Um, for will forever be a mystery to me. There is a reason that other people are doctors and I am not. Uh, yeah, I know. I should have asked Ryan about it before he went to work. Have him explain it to me. This is a highly morning. specific scuba diving question. <laughs> yeah. He majored in biochem, so I'd like oh, to think he could help me, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, but anyways, what I want you to take away from that is that you are going so deep with technical diving that you can't just use regular air in like the typical scuba canisters you have to very specifically create like a mixture to combat what happens to the human body past 30 meters does it have to be done in stages like can you breathe the normal stuff to a certain depth and then you have to switch over that's a really good question i think that might be the case um Because they, and I mentioned this briefly later, but when you do really deep dives like this and in the preparation stages, kind of what Dion was doing, people will go down and put different canisters at different depths. And I wasn't sure if that was because they run out necessarily or if they are different gases. It would make a lot of sense if they were different gases. 
Huh. Interesting. Also further complicating the process. Mm -hmm. Especially if you get disoriented and you don't know which canister is which. Mm -hmm. Why do humans feel the need to do this? I will never know. That is why I love these stories. It's why I love the mountaineering disasters. That's why this one caught my interest because I'll never do it. But it fascinates the heck out of me that other people want to. I love hearing about humans pushing the limits of human bodies or pushing the limits of like what we can do in nature. It is so interesting to me. It makes me nervous. You have, we have cell phones. Why are we doing this? We can all just sit on our cell phones and Google things and YouTube things and we don't need to do, no. I know. Bravo for other people doing it. I don't, I will never understand it. It will forever make me nervous. I know. I know. I get it. Well, sit back and don't relax then because this is going to be really unpleasant for you. Yay. Another big difference we need to talk about to put technical diving into perspective is decompression. Bailey, do you know what the bends is? Um, I think so. Have we talked about the abyss here? I don't think we have. I think we briefly mentioned that it was mom's favorite yes. romance. Her her romantic movie. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That's where I'm familiar because I remember there was a whole conversation about, you know, coming up too fast. It makes you go crazy or makes Mm -hmm. you disoriented. That is my context, my background knowledge of the spins. That's the bends, not the spins. The the spins is when you have actual martinis. Yes. You had too too many martinis (laughs) if you got the spins. That's true. Uh, Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is because you're not wrong. (laughs) I mean, you're kind of wrong, but not completely. (laughs) Or I'm going to let Wikipedia tell you because that's where I learned all of this. Metabolically inert gases in the diver's breathing gas, such as nitrogen and helium, are absorbed into body tissues when breathed under high pressure, mainly during the deepest phase of a dive. So those dissolved gases must be released slowly from the body tissues by controlling the ascent rate to restrict the formation and growth of bubbles. So if you go, if you go really deep, um, you can't come up too quickly because otherwise you will get gas the bubbles rough. in your blood. That is not, I mean, why are you this way? Because <laughs> it's been- <laughs> I don't know. It popped into my head and I'm dying to say it for like <laughs> the your, runs? The whole explanation. I can't help. I can't explain it. What is wrong with you? Can we get through one episode without you mentioning farts or... Anxious? I'll stop laughing when it stops being funny. No. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Moving on. I was listening to the bulk of that. Uh, I hope so. Divers do this, they prevent the formation and growth of bubbles in their blood by making pit stops at various depths on their way back up to the surface. Okay. A lot, it's kind of a similar technique as to how mountain climbers need to acclimate at certain altitudes to avoid altitude sickness. Okay. So, similar to that. The body, the human body, does not tolerate anything other than normal atmospheric pressure well. That not is, less than, not more than. Again, that is true. Why do we do this? I know. I know. Yeah, there some of these stories, especially ones that result in needless tragedy, I'm like, if we just didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So that's technical diving. Those are some of our concerns. You have to resurface really, really slowly. You have to be really mm-hmm. careful about the gases that you're breathing, how long you're spending down there. You got it? I do. It makes for a very long process. Extremely long. Um, okay, so back to the story. While Dave was on his record-breaking dive in Bushman's Hole, he stumbled upon Dion's body at 270 meters. So that's... Very deep. And well below what you said he was supposed to do. What Didn't you say they lost track of him at like 150? At 50. Oh. Oh, I'm thinking 150 feet is what I'm... 160 feet, yeah. Okay, okay. So this is 270 meters. So that's about 880 feet, if my okay. math is Checks anywhere out. close to Sounds being good correct. to me. I know it's a little less than 900. <laughs> Too far. Too far in my opinion. Yes. That is... 
the deepest anyone had ever gone on a rebreather. That is the deepest. That's how he broke all those records. Oh, this makes sense. Yes. So uh, he saw, and it was totally by chance. Like he said, like I said, they all knew that his body was down there, but it had been 10 years and mm-hmm. he was not going down there to look for it. Right. So he just totally by chance stumbled upon it. He saw that the body was remarkably intact and resting peacefully in one place. But because everything's extremely still. I mean, they're like, no, nothing's happening down there. Right. It looks kind of enclosed in the pictures I was seeing. Mm -hmm. Are there fish here? Is this like a very... I don't think so. Okay. It looked very enclosed and isolated. And so I'm... I'm I'm sure there's microfauna, but... Yeah. uh, Nothing big to... Oh, God. I hope not. Wouldn't that be scary? (laughs) Yes, it would, which is why you shouldn't go down there. You're going to find those like crazy bioluminescent angler fish, but they're like mega big. I know. He saw that the body... Oh, I'm sorry. I just said that. Okay. But when you're diving at those depths, you don't just decide to bring back a body. Because like I said, so technical. Every second counts. You and have- you're only... Like that would expend maybe more energy than so you had intended much on. energy. Yeah. And we're going to yeah. talk about that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So also to put this in perspective, every minute that he spends down at that depth is an hour of decompression on the way up. Oh. So when he um, made it down, well, like I said earlier, it was a nine hour and 40 minute dive. He was down there for about 10 minutes and it took him about 10 hours to come back up. It, did, would, did he intend to be down there for 10 minutes? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I read somewhere that he would bring like candy bars with him and, uh, how would he eat I, those? I don't know. I'm not sure. He's have, not in a space suit. No. How would he eat that? I have personally never tried to eat anything underwater, but apparently it was possible. That sounds disgusting. I agree with you. And confusing. Yes. Uh, okay. So he laid a line to the body and after a lengthy trip back to the surface, he called Dion's parents and promised to go back for his body and to bring it home. I know. I mean, do you want to share your feelings? Yeah, I guess I, I don't know what I would do. It's, um, it's one of, it's one of those things where it's like, I suppose if obviously if they want it and they want to put their son to rest in, in the way they originally wanted to, on the other hand, it's been 10 years Mm -hmm. and, it felt like there was some closure with the plaque and like knowing that this was his final resting place. Mm-hmm. Well, and also knowing that he died kind of mysteriously mm-hmm. um, there, knowing that no one else had found him for this long, which means that no one else was able to get that deep. Right. Um, so it's obviously extremely dangerous. And I completely understand wanting to have your child home. Of but course. I would think I would also be extremely hesitant to, well, they didn't ask him to go do it. He called them and said, I found your son. I'm going to get him. I don't think oh. it was so much of a, do you want him? I think it was, I found him and I'm going to go get him. Interesting. Okay. Well, that that is a different dynamic then. Yeah. that's Which, which then, again, did they want that? Well, they were very enthusiastic about it. They oh, did not good. hesitate to say yes. Everyone okay. was on the same page. They um, So there is... I was just about to mention it in a couple of sentences, but I got a lot of this information from a uh, documentary that came out actually just last year called oh. Dave Not Coming Back um, that uh, details all of like this entire process. Interesting. I saw that movie poster when I was Googling the actual cave the hole, whatever it is. It's pretty good. Yeah, it definitely it does a very good job of explaining Dave and some of the other people involved uh but they show because there were there have been actually a lot of documentaries done about this this one Mm -hmm. just was free and came out last year so I figured it was going to be done pretty well uh I would definitely suggest that I've linked the free version of it in the show notes fantastic yes uh but you can see Dion's parents they uh when they meet Dave for the first time and all of that good stuff and everyone's on the same page and a lot of dave's fellow diving buddies admitted they said he really was he was a good guy no one was trying to say anything otherwise but they were like when you're a technical diver you're you're doing it for the dive and he said his dion's body was kind of an excuse for him to go back again Mm -hmm. um so he was determined to do it but it didn't take any convincing like he really just wanted to go dive again. again Um, okay. 
So Dave and his best friend slash diving buddy, Don Shirley, assembled a team of divers and organizers to help bring Dion back. Uh, There's also a really good outside online magazine article called Raising the Dead about this that does a fantastic job of detailing Dave, Don, and Dion, and everyone else. But my free reads on outside expired, so I wasn't able to use it as a source (laughs) for this episode. So paywalled. if you can read it, that'd be great. If anyone wants to buy us a subscription to outside, I would take it. (laughs) Anyways, I did read it several months ago, though, when I first heard about this. It is very, very good. Okay, moving on. (laughs) uh, Okay, what Dave and his team planned to do was basically have Dave dive to Dion's body and then hand it off to another diver at each decompression stop on the way up. So they would all start to go down, I think, before Dave... And they were there long enough to where they had timed it so Dave would go down. In 13 minutes, he would make it down to the bottom and with the body, put the body in the bag, swim up to the deep first decompression stop where Don, his best friend, was waiting. And I, I think it, this is my only complaint with the documentary is that I think they could have explained this just a little bit better. But they do have a bit of a diagram and maybe I was just too tired to like – really appreciate it yeah but um so i think they went down before dave and so by the time the body would get to them they would be able to go up faster instead of just waiting with the body for however many hours yeah yeah i i had no idea that it only took 13 minutes for them to get down there i was thinking this was a very long huh the all of the hard stuff is on the way back huh Mm mm-hmm Um, he and everyone else involved spent weeks preparing and practiced every single second of the dive. They made, yeah, they made a special body bag with quick release ties that would be easy to undo at depth with all of Dave's equipment. And, uh, so it had a mesh end so the water could flow through it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Dave practiced putting his wife into the body bag in their living room, which was something she did not love, but something he became very good at. (laughs) I would, I, ooh, that would be, I would, mm, might be where I draw the line at love. Yeah. It doesn't look like a regular body bag. It looks like a duffel bag because I actually think his wife made it. Um, oh. Yeah. The police were there and they were going to be waiting basically at the bottleneck of the cave because they don't dive like this. The police were not interested. In, Who does? Yeah. They were not interested in trying to recover this body, but because a body was involved. They had to be there. Well, and if even if somebody else had found the body and the police needed to recover it, they still probably would have hired these same people because well, exactly. who else has these specialized diving skills? Yes, exactly. Um, okay. During preparations for the dive, Dave and his team made a last minute decision to have Dave wear a helmet fitted with a camera. He didn't typically wear a helmet, much less one with an early 2000s bulky video camera kind of thing. <sighs> But he practiced with it on and felt very confident that it wouldn't impact the dive at all. You can actually, in this documentary, see him get into a pool with his helmet and this camera and put his goggles on. He doesn't have any of his other gear on, but he, like, dips his head in the water and kind of moves around. And he comes back up and in his thick Australian accent is like, which I'm not going to try to do. Do it. I can't. I truly can't. But he is like, oh, yeah, not a problem. Perfect. I can do this so easy. But can't. First of all, cameras, like you said, are huge back then. How did any of them function at that depth? I mean, I didn't even know there I were don't have underwater cameras. Any idea? I have no clue. Well, they put it into. It looks like a regular camcorder, like a two thousand five was camcorder. Was it even waterproof, or they just like here? <laughs> Probably. And then they put it into it some block bag. <laughs> no, they put it into a casing, which I don't know if it waterproofed it, but it might have helped to protect it from the pressure. Mm-hmm. Okay, enough from the peanut gallery about the camcorder. Okay, fine. So on January questions. on January 8th, 2005, as Dion's parents watched from the rocky shore, Dave and his team members put their heavy equipment on and on cue began their ascent to the dark depths of Bushman's Cave. 
Um, they also, fun fact that I learned from the documentary, the woman who was like organizing everything, sat in her chair with her clipboard, timing and like doing all of the math, I think was the female that held the record for deepest dive, technical dive at that point. Cool. Yeah. And did they break that with this dive? She didn't dive. She stayed on the surface and told everyone when to go down. She was the one running the show. But did she have the, like, at the time that was her? Because didn't he break all those records? Wasn't that the deal? Yeah, but she was the female to do Oh, it. I see. I see. Yeah. Yes. At the time, she held those records. Gotcha. So she was highly respected, trusted. Um, yeah, she was super cool for good, doing it. Good person to have on your team. Yeah. With her expertise. Yes. So they had a ton of people in the hole, like on the shore and on the rocky part. Um, and she was there doing everything. So spirits were good. People were taking it very seriously, but they were, you know, like these are obviously kind of adrenaline junkies. And so you can imagine that they're all kind of hyping each other up. And, um, and also when these people go into the water, they do look like astronauts. I mean, they don't have like these huge helmets on, but the amount of equipment on their bodies is insane. But they're still in wetsuits, right? They are, but they're not typical wetsuits. Like, I think they have several layers of wetsuits, but the okay. outermost one is actually pretty bulky. It's not very hmm. tight. Um, and then they have their flippers, but they have these massive cans of gas. And rebreathers are like two long tubes that come in front of your face. So especially in cave diving, this is huge bulky equipment. And there are, okay, we'll get into more of the equipment, but I just want people to know this is not like the diving or, you know, like flopping backwards off a boat kind of equipment. Like this is uh, like, I'm going to the moon equipment. This, it looks like it. Yeah. This, I'm looking at a $3,000 dive suit that is mm -hmm. like, yeah, it is, it is like a space suit with everything but gloves. Yeah, exactly. Wow. In 13 minutes, just as planned, Dave made it to Dion's body. Don Shirley waited above him at his first stopping point. Experts had told Dave that Dion's body would be negatively buoyant because what little of his body was exposed was reduced to bone. However, which would have just been like his hands and mm -hmm. I think some of his face. However, all of Dion's body within his wetsuit had turned to a soap-like substance that floats. Oh. Yeah, that's as gross as it'll get. Um, okay. It really wasn't, like, gory or anything. I mean, I, you can't find images or anything like this, but that um, was not something that he anticipated. So when Dave started to lift Dion's body to put it into his bag, it started to float. An, oh. Which is not what he expected. So it kind of started to float, and it started to spin. Oh, no. So he was now working with both hands to keep the body steady, so he rested his can light on the silty cave floor. No, 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 no. That can light was very powerful and had to be connected to his equipment by wires that are usually worn on the diver, oh, sorry, on the diver's waist or tanks. So typically, Dave, he had a habit of wrapping the wire behind his neck to keep it out of the way. But with the large helmet and camera he was now wearing, he couldn't do that. Okay. The lines from the body bag became entangled with the light head. And at 270 meters, the mere physical effort of trying to free himself from the tangle led to respiratory distress. Oh, my God. Okay. Footage taken from Dave's camera showed him breathless, struggling to free himself, and soon after, his breathing became labored. He lost consciousness and died. I hate this story so much. I, I didn't, I did, I thought this, this is not where I thought we were going with this. Okay. I know. The divers had all promised each other that should something go wrong, there would be no heroes. No one wanted their body recovered. Uh, no one wanted to risk anyone else's life. Mm -hmm. to make this happen despite this when dave failed to meet don shirley at his stopping point with the body no. don feared for his best friend's life and began to descend no he descended several more meters before seeing dave's cave light still and bright against the black abyss below it don instantly knew that his friend was not coming back he then swam back to the next stopping point where he met the next dive member suffering permanent damage to his inner ears because of the unscheduled change in depth. I was going to say, yeah, he just swam right up there? Yeah, he oh. sure did. 
Um, he actually, there was a lot more that was wrong with him, but I couldn't find, unless I wanted to go back and rewatch a lot of the documentary and try to jot down a ton of these details, Mm -hmm. um, you can look it up. It's not super important to the story, but Don was having a really hard time for lots of reasons. Yeah. On his small underwater message board, he scrambled to write, Dave not coming back. The diver. So that's how they, okay. I, cause mm-hmm. I was going to say how, if an emergency happened like this, how, do, how can they, how did they, they, so had they have a communication hand signals method. and they also had these boards and okay. like, it looks like a crayon that can write underwater mm-hmm. okay. on these boards. The divers then began their long trip back to the surface. When the first diver surfaced and reported back to the team organizer, that woman with the record, that Dave was gone, a quiet panic set in amongst those in the hole as they focused on getting the rest of the divers safely to the surface. Um, Upon his return, Don Shirley was treated for his injuries and taken to a decompression chamber. Technical divers always know this is a possibility, but for someone of Dave's skill level and with his experience, it seemed surreal. Three days later, the team members executed a dive to retrieve their equipment as they had gone down the day before the recovery dive to lay lines and Mm -hmm. um, gas canisters. As the team members pulled gently on the lines, Dave's body was pulled to the surface. Miraculously, the minor tangle that had cost Dave his life was enough to pull Dion's body to the surface as well. Really? True to his word, Dave had kept his promise. I'm going to cry. Are you kidding? Wow. That is the story of Bushman Hole Diving Disaster. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh, but so heartbreaking. I mean, on the one hand, you poetically said he did exactly what he promised he would do. But man, how... Mm. Mm-hmm. His poor wife. Yes. Yeah. Very, very rough. She's in this documentary as well. She, I think, is now, it, it, this was 2005, I think she's now a little bit more at peace with it. But mm-hmm. I think, she, like a lot of spouses to extreme sport people, yeah, I think she's kind you of... want to support she, them, but in their passions, and especially a noble pursuit such as yeah. this. But on the other hand... She's mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Understandably so. Yeah. Um, mm. So, yeah, that is that is the story of Dave. He was also a commercial airline pilot. Um, of course he was. Yeah. Good. He really had a need for thrill. He sure I did. Mean, I'm sure commercial airline pilots are like, eh, we, we, <laughs> we just kind of hang out in the cockpit. But, you know, flying, flying is a, a rush, I think. Yeah. Well, fun fact, he actually... If you remember our um, Delta 191, the flight that crashed in Dallas that we covered a couple weeks ago, Mm -hmm. that was a a Lockheed TriStar 1011. He flew those when he was a pilot. Mm -hmm. I have so many mixed emotions. I know. I don't know how to feel. I feel happy. I feel super sad. Yeah. I know. Regret (laughs) on behalf of everyone. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, so Don, uh, still struggles with his balance and some other issues that, um, were a result of his injuries that he sustained. They actually, it was pretty scary. They, he almost died on the way up. Um, it sounds like he just, I didn't do it justice by explaining it then, but he, when he was meeting the divers on his way up, he was vomiting, he was confused, he was spinning, he did not know what was going on. And so he almost lost his life trying to figure out what happened to, but thankfully he did not. He's still teaching technical diving. And for this documentary, he performed all of the stunts. (laughs) What? Yeah, he did all of the, um, I think he played himself. He recreated all of the scenes. So he's not afraid of the water no. he's not he didn't say that's enough of that for my lifetime he got back on that horse yep. so to speak yes wow he absolutely did yeah he's very courageous mm-hmm. yeah it's a, a really fascinating that's the other thing i really like about these the communities and the groups of people that do things like this are just mm-hmm. so interesting to me the technical diving community is just wild. And 
close and ride or die. And like mm-hmm. how I think that's my new fear. Like the way you feel about airplanes is the way I feel about disorientation underwater. Because when you said that he was like vomiting and unaware of his surroundings, like asphyxia in general is petrifying. But to get disoriented and like need to throw up. If you forget to put your breathing apparatus back on and, like, if you, like, oh, my. Uh, 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 got to yeah. take big, deep gulps of air. So to reassure myself that I am not underwater right now, uh, yeah. my brain is. I was starting, when I was describing it to you initially, it kind of registered with me how deep and dark and, like, there is no light that gets that deep. It's all happening in the dark. All yeah. of this is happening in the dark. Also. Exactly. And they showed that um, Don does a lot of his like personal practice diving in a um, flooded mine, or like obviously a retired mine, but mm-hmm. that's flooded. And so he took the camera through with him. And uh, you, if you don't like stir up the silt that settled, um, you like when you're diving through it it doesn't look like it's underwater it's so still and pristine it's so unsettling it's it's crazy um like that at all also worth mentioning this was a really big deal in the diving community because when things like this happen like i said they typically have the body And there are only so many things that these people are really experienced. They're not taking unnecessary risks. So if something bad happens, you have to assume that it was like, like you said, the asphyxia or the deep water blackout or Mm -hmm. something. So when his body floated to the surface with his perfectly intact camera, they were eager to know exactly what happened. And you can watch it. Nope, I don't think I will. Yeah. I think that is best left not for my mind's eye to have I, They showed part of it in the documentary. It's obviously not graphic or anything. Um, mm-hmm. You can just see his hands working, and you can start to hear his breathing get sharper and like a grunt or two, but they cut it before. Okay, so here's the interesting part is that Don was talking about how when they – somehow the news stations got – the video footage Mm. and they wanted to show everything obviously Mm, mm, mm. and so they invited him onto a show to talk about it and he was so upset that they were showing his friend dying that he tried to get out that he wanted to get on the show so he could talk over it so they couldn't replay the episodes in like all of their yeah kind of gory detail so he went and he was like i tried to literally talk over it so you couldn't hear it so people couldn't focus on it And so then in that interview in the documentary where he was saying that they kind of break the fourth wall for, well, I guess there is no fourth wall in an interview in a documentary, but they kind of break for a second. And the interviewer says, we've actually been discussing amongst the interview staff or amongst the documentary staff, how much of it we should show. And he immediately snaps in. He was like, you stop at the cat's cradle, which is where all of his equipment starts to get tangled. Mm. And he was like, that's what I always do. There's no need to watch anything past that. And that's exactly what they did. So if you watch the documentary, it's not going to traumatize you in the way Mm -hmm. that seeing some other things might. But knowing what happens, it is definitely disturbing. So watch with caution. But they give you a lot of heads up before that part. Okay. Yeah, because it's it like you said, it's like it feels needless to yes. uh, watch it in uh, full full detail and mm-hmm. just d- distressing. And yeah, I already can't breathe just thinking about this. I don't want to immerse another sense and then just like no, I think I would feel like I was underwater. Yeah, it's it's a brutal one, but I uh, I'm happy I finally got to do this one because I'd been thinking about it for a long time. But there are so many technical aspects to it that I was kind of nervous about it. But it's like I watched that documentary and it kind of sold me. It's like it was so moving and just Mm -hmm. fascinating to me. So there it is. Well done, Moo. That was incredible. I had no idea where you were taking me (laughs) on this journey. And although it made me feel feelings that I don't like feeling, um, I do appreciate everything. Thank you so much for listening for another week. We love having you here. Uh, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, wherever you Tell listen. everyone you love dearly. Even if you don't like them, tell your enemies. We don't care. We'll make friends out of them. We can all be best friends. 
unless you like really don't like them and then we also don't like them but we don't mind if they hate listen to us exactly but then you should like email us and clue us into the drama because that would be yeah, fun too definitely and then we'll have a drama corner on every episode where we can spill your deepest darkest <laughs> secrets oh my gosh. talk about listeners and their relationships with other people who listen this podcast just gets messier and messier by the week hey drama is a disaster that is so true i know every week i think what was what's been my personal disaster this week and you I just start talking about the real housewives <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my personal disaster there is that I lost my password and now I can't watch any of the Real Housewives. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm so upset. Okay, moving on, moving on. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> moving on. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll catch you next week. Same time next week. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. Goodbye.